and have a seat. I'm so excited to be almost done with this series on Philippians. Uh, today we are continuing in our sermon series from Paul to the Philippian church. If you have your Bible or Bible app, go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 4. Uh, we'll begin looking at verse 10. If you're using one of the Bibles located underneath the seat in front of you, you'll find Philippians 4 on page 1166. And if you are in Alumni Hall right now, we want to say thanks for joining us. We're glad to be there. You can jump up. If you don't have a Bible, go grab one at the table in the back of the room and turn to page 1166 as well. Parker, we're so glad that you are there in our online community. If you don't have a Bible that you can read or understand easily, please read reach out to us, send us an email, let us know on social media. We will send you a Bible if we can or deliver one to you if you live in Cancun, Mexico, staying at an all-inclusive resort. <laughs> that is already taken. The volunteer spot is already taken. So, Hey, uh, w there's a reason why we value the Bible that we value God's word. It is indeed God's word. It does have the ability to change us, to sharpen us, and to transform us into the men and women that God has created us to be. We really believe that if we read God's word and apply his word, he will change our lives. Now, today as we kick off, I wanna talk about for a minute, just a little bit about social media. Raise your hand if you have a social media account. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Pinterest, anything along those lines. Keep your hands up for just a minute. Raise them up. Be high, high and proud. Okay, thank you. Now, I, I post on social media quite often. You can find me on Facebook, on Instagram, and Twitter. If you search Pastor Joe Donahue, there I'll be. Now, if you already follow me, you know that I often post pictures of my family. I post pictures of travel highlights. I'll take videos of nonsense sometimes. Uh, and of course, I always talk about food and restaurants in my travels. I want to confess something to you, though. You will not see the real Donahue family if you follow me on social media. Uh, you won't see the arguments that I have with my wife. A in fact, if you follow me on social media, you probably think that Christy and I have the most perfect relationship imaginable. And you will probably think that our children are amazing angels sent to us by God, that they are perfect without blemish or fault. You won't see the frustrations that they have with me you won't see the times that I blow it when I'm trying to be a good dad and end up being a horrible dad. You won't hear about the arguments that when my wife is right and I'm wrong or even vice versa. Um, you won't see me posting when my kids are driving me crazy or when I'm driving them crazy. Now, every now and then I may provide a, a tiny glimpse uh, of what the real life is like, but mostly I stay away from that side of me. And people like me are the problem with social media. People like me are the problem with social media. See, week after week, I see people taking a break from social media. Uh, moms are following other moms and they think these other moms have it all together, that they work a nine to five job and then they come home and dinner's on the table and laundry's folded up and dishes are all done and they sit at the table and they get the homework done and everyone's in bed by eight o'clock and up at six o'clock the next morning. Uh, people think that as they look at other moms who do the same thing that I do, act like we have it all together, and they get frustrated and they say, there's no way I can live under this microscope. There's no way I can live up to this. Well, I don't even live up to that. Moms that post that way don't live up to that. Uh, there are people that stop posting and they take a break because they feel like they're not perfect enough to be on social media, that everybody else has it all together and they don't. And so they feel frustrated, they feel overwhelmed, and they simply are not satisfied 
with who God has created them to be. And they grow discontent. When we compare ourselves with other people, we're going to feel dissatisfied with life. We will never feel like we measure up to the world's expectations of us. And ultimately, that will lead to us living our lives never being content, at peace, and satisfied. As Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians, he was chained up. He was under house arrest. He had Roman guards standing over him. He was poorly clothed. He rarely bathed. And he had meager rations of food assigned to him. But we would never guess that Paul lived underneath those conditions. And he lived underneath those conditions for two years because he seemed so happy and he seemed so content when he wrote this letter. Today, we're going to learn the secret of Paul's contentment, the secret of Paul's strength. Today, we're going to learn how the Apostle Paul was under those conditions, still able to strengthen, instruct, and encourage the church in Philippi, even while he was in prison, confined, and had meager conditions. Now, at this point in Philippians chapter 4, Paul begins to express his gratitude to the church for a financial gift that was given to him. He knew that they were concerned about him, but they just didn't have an opportunity to show how much they were concerned about him. And as I begin to read, I want you to know I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation today. You are certainly welcome to follow along from the ESV version that's underneath the seat in front of you or from your own copy of God's Word. Philippians 4, beginning at verse 10. Paul writes, How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in any and every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now, as Paul began to thank the Philippians for the gift that they sent, now we can assume that it was financial. It may have been food and clothing as well. But first, he acknowledged that they were always concerned about him, but they had not yet had an opportunity to show it until he was imprisoned. Now, if you're a part of a life group, maybe you've experienced something similar. Not talking about prison, but maybe somebody in your life group was getting married, and so your life group got together and threw a wedding shower for them. Uh, You didn't have an opportunity to show how much you loved them, but now that they're engaged, you have that opportunity. Or maybe somebody in your life group is pregnant or was pregnant. They were having a baby. And so your life group got together and said, hey, let's throw a baby shower for them. Or maybe you signed up to help with a meal train when they had a loved one pass away. You were always concerned about that individual, uh, but when they had a need that was the chance for you to show them how much you really loved them and how much you cared for them. So Paul addressed that, but he wrote from just a slightly different angle. When Paul used the word need, it actually translates poverty. He said, I I was in poverty and you helped me. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware of what Paul's occupation was. Paul was, according to Acts chapter 18, verse 3, he was a tent maker. Wherever Paul went, he worked with his hands for a living. He hired himself out. He made belts. He used uh, crafted leather. Uh, He made man-made stuff. And usually a tent maker worked with leather, a leather craftsman of some form. Paul refused to be paid by the churches that he ministered to. Paul refused to accept any type of salary from them. He preferred to work with his hands because he said, I don't want to ever be accused of charging money for the gospel. 
This is God's calling on his life. So he wanted to be able to work with his hands to provide his own source of income. But now that Paul was under house arrest, he was unable to work with his hands. He had no source of income. And to add insult to injury, being under house arrest meant that Paul actually had to pay rent on the house where he was living. So they imprisoned him and then he had to pay rent on where he was. So I would imagine that he had depleted most of his income or most of his savings that he had made. Any bit of, any bit of money that he had went towards paying rents to keep him in prison. How would you like that? You get sentenced, you get sentenced to prison and then you had to pay for your cell, pay for your food that you had while you were there. Paul was broke. He was broke financially. When he used that word need, he meant he was in poverty. Raise your hand if you've ever been there. Raise your hand if you've ever been broke and at the point of poverty. And Paul said this, he said, even though I'm at the point of poverty, I'm still okay because I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Now, I want to ask you, you a question, and this is a rhetorical question. Have I learned to be content or have you learned to be content? Ask yourself, have you learned to be content are you okay with having nothing? Would you be okay? This is rhetorical. Please don't answer out loud. Would you be okay if you had no clothing, no food, no shelter? See, Paul said he's learned the secret to be content with nothing or with everything. Whether his table was filled with delicious food or whether he had no food at all to eat, whether he went to bed on a full stomach or whether he hadn't had anything to eat in days, Paul said he was content. I gave my life to Jesus in 1991 and I was very blessed early on in my faith to learn how to be content in my journey with Jesus. Now, that was a difficult season in my life. I graduated from high school. I was working construction. I made about $4.60 an hour. Almost every bit of money that I earned went to paying rents. And then what I had left, I bought some food. I had no money for entertainment. I hardly had any money to get tires replaced on my car, any gas in my vehicles. And God began to teach me during that season how to be content. And he used four passages, or, or four, really, four ideas in Scripture. And I'm going to pass those on to you today. First, I learned that God is sovereign. You can write that down in your notes. God is sovereign. The first passage that God impressed upon me was from, uh, was from Solomon in the, letter, in the Ecclesiastes. The Bible calls Solomon the wisest person that ever lived. And since the Bible describes Solomon that way, I'm not going to argue with them. Through wisdom in Ecclesiastes 3.14, Solomon said this, I know that whatever God does, it will be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it. God does this that men should fear before him. I trusted early on in my faith that God is sovereign. Whatever God desires to do, he will do. I can never add anything to what God does. What he does is so good, I can't make it better. And I'm powerless to take anything away from what God does, even if I don't like it, even if it makes me uncomfortable, 
even if it is not my preference and it goes against my desires for my life. I trust that God is sovereign and I trust that he has allowed this thing to come into my life, even if I don't like it, to help sharpen my character and make me the man of God he desires me to be. If you want to learn to be content, you have to trust and accept God's sovereignty in your life. Secondly, I I learned that God was unstoppable. And you say it's kind of related. Yeah, it kind of is. There was a man named Job in the Bible. If you're looking for a job, just go there. You'll find it in the Bible. There was a man named Job. And Satan went to God boasting about how the people on earth were just filled with evil and vile and everyone had turned away from God. And God said, hey, have you thought about my servant Job? I mean, he's righteous. He's following me no matter what. And Satan said to him, yeah, but that's because you're protecting him. You stop protecting him. You let me attack him and we'll see how long Job is faithful. So God stopped blessing and and protecting Job. And Satan attacked and essentially destroyed everything that Job loved in life. His children, his cattle, he had infectious sores pop up all over his body. In short, Job was devastated when God withdrew his protection. Yet this is what Job said about God in Job 9.12. He said, if he takes away, who can hinder him? Who can say to him, what are you doing? In other words, if God is going to allow something I love and hold dear to be taken away from me in my life, I am unable to stop him. Whining does not help. Crying about it does not help. A pity party over my troubles does not help. And if you really want to learn how to be content in life, you have to trust that God is unstoppable. And I also had to accept that life is hard. The third passage that God gave me that, got, that has helped, to, uh, helped me learn to be content is from the Apostle Paul. Paul's the same guy that wrote this passage and he said, look, I don't speak in regard to need for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances describes some of the hardships that he had faced in life as a follower of Jesus. And he described them to the Corinthian church. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 25, five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 stripes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, not stoned like in the 70s. He was stoned with rocks. Three times, he writes, I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I've faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I've faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as the Gentiles. I've faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. I've faced danger from men who claim to be believers, but are not. I've worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Regardless of the challenges that you and I have faced since we became followers of Jesus, our trials and tribulations are nothing like what Paul experienced. Nothing. Paul had all of these troubles and calamity happen to him after he surrendered his life to Jesus. After he received forgiveness for his sins, after he acknowledged that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Jesus did die on the cross to pay the penalty for his sins, that he rose from the dead and that one day he's going to return after he confessed with his mouth that Jesus was indeed Lord, then he began to experience difficulties in life. And yet, Paul was content. 
he went to bed at night or he slept on, out in the desert at night at peace and content. And I learned that if I was gonna continue to follow Jesus, I had to accept that life is hard, but that the truth of Romans 8, 28 matters that God causes everything to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. And I believe that even if something I would consider evil happened to me, ultimately, if I continue to love God and continue to uh, walk faithfully with him, God would redeem the bad situation for good. God would take the terrible and God would make it terrific. And I'm convinced the reason why Paul, uh, the reason why God does that is because you and I will never be separated from his love. Romans 8:38. Paul said, I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, or demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. See, I understood early on in my walk with Jesus those truths that God is sovereign, that God is unstoppable, that life is hard, but my character is shaped through difficult circumstances. And no matter what I face, everything has been sifted through the loving hands of God and that he can redeem the bad and make it better. And he can take the terrible and he can make it terrific because of God's constant love that I will never be separated from. Not in this life and not in the next. And if you can begin to trust the character of God, if you can begin to trust the heart of God, if you can begin to trust the sovereign love that God has for you, then you're ready to learn the real secret of strength. The secret to strength is contentment in Christ. The secret to strength is contentment in Christ. If you want to be able to withstand anything that life throws at you, if you want to be able to walk through fire and not get burned, you have to trust that real strength, real courage, real character, real power comes through Jesus. Not in your ability to get through those hard times, but that real contentment, real strength is found in Jesus Christ. And that means it's okay to not be okay. You and I are never going to be perfect. We don't live in a perfect world. Sometimes it's like Siphius' stone where we're just constantly pushing that boulder up a hill only to have it roll back down. And if we were perfect, Jesus would not have had to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your and my sin. Think about this. As I think about the Apostle Paul and I think about what he walked through, if you worked for an employer that caused you to be beaten, shipwrecked, whipped, imprisoned, starved, and chased out of towns, how long would you work for that employer? You'd be filing lawsuits left and right. And yet, as followers of Jesus, we're going to have hard times. It's going to be difficult. And Paul remained content through it all because he had Jesus living inside of him. Paul had a moment where he surrendered his life to Jesus. He committed his life to God and received forgiveness for his sins. And it's because of that he could go through anything without whining, without complaining, that is why he could say those words, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He wasn't talking about lifting weights and playing football. He was talking about life. 
and hardships and hunger and brokenness. And he said, because of Christ, I can do it. I don't know what troubles, I don't know what challenges that you are facing today. I don't know if you're a follower of Jesus or not. But I do want to invite you to become a follower of Jesus at the close of this service. Our prayer team is going to be here after the last song. I want to invite you, come down front and tell them that you're ready to experience contentment in life through a relationship with Jesus. And they will help lead you to that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're humble, if you're willing, if you're willing to surrender your strength and exchange it for God's mighty strength found in Jesus, they will be able to lead you to that life-changing relationship. Let's pray together. Father, we want to say thank you we believe that contentment is only found through Jesus. We believe that real strength is only found through a relationship with Jesus. We believe your word that says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. We're content with that. And Lord, I know we're all on a different journey. Some of us haven't yet learned how to be content. Even some followers of Jesus have not yet learned what I was blessed to be able to grasp early on in my faith. God, I pray a special blessing of contentment over them. Thank you that we can learn the secret of being content, that contentment is a learned behavior. And Lord, help us to apply it to our lives. Lord, I invite you to open up the hearts of anyone here who has not yet surrendered their life to Jesus and give wisdom to our prayer team as they talk and counsel with them. And Lord, we do pray that we would be able to celebrate with those who would commit and surrender to Jesus Christ today. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said.